parallel to the spin axis of the planet. And those red dots are the location of the magnetic equator looking down from the North Pole. So all looks well. But now if we can start the animation, you'll see where that magnetic equator lies. It is not at the geographic equator of the planet, which is that gray line. It is north of, systematically north, on every orbit, north of the geographic equator by two-tenths of a planet radius. What that means is that the magnetic field in the northern hemisphere is stronger and differs from that in the southern hemisphere. And it means that the process that creates the magnetic field, which we think is somewhat similar to that in Earth, that it, it arises from dynamo processes in the planet's core, must be capable of producing this asymmetry between the north and the south. Now, there are some consequences of having this strongly asymmetric field, and one of them is depicted on the next slide. If, if you map the magnetic field lines at the north and south polar regions of Mercury, those magnetic field lines look pretty complicated, but focus on what is different between the north and the south, the north on the left and the south on the right. And what is different is the area around the pole itself, the areas with the letters, N and S. And the next slide shows those uh, in, in more detail. Those areas are called polar caps, for students of the magnetosphere. And they are areas where the field lines don't close around the planet but are open to interplanetary space. Why is that important? It is important because open field lines are like interstate highways for charged particles from the interplanetary environment. And those charged particles come roaring in and hit the surface of Mercury. What happens when they do? One of the things is that material is kicked off the surface and contributes to Mercury's very tenuous atmosphere called an exosphere. And another is that the impacts of these charged particles change slowly over time, that the chemistry and the color and the reflective properties of the surface by a, a set of processes known as space weathering. So a prediction of this new model for Mercury's magnetic field is that the processes of generation of the exosphere and the processes of changing the uh, color and reflectance of Mercury's surface should be very different near the North Pole and near the South Pole, and we'll be testing the, these ideas as we go forward. But Mercury's magnetic field environment, Mercury's magnetosphere, is different in some other ways as well, and I will turn the podium now to my colleague Ralph McNutt to describe some other new results. Thank you, Sean. What I'd like to do is to amplify on some of the things that Sean is talking about, about the magnetosphere, and also talk a little bit about a rather serendipitous discovery uh, that was made with the instruments that uh, Larry was talking about for, uh, for doing our geochemistry observations. And if I could have the first graphic, please. Um, Larry was talking about using our gamma ray spectrometer to look for gamma rays from the surface of the planet. And this is actually what the, the gamma ray spectrometer on Messenger looks like in schematic. Uh, the yellow part at the top actually points back toward the surface of the planet. That's nominally where the gamma rays come in through. through. And the blow-up shows the, uh, the working piece of this. The, the red area is actually a, a single polished crystal of germanium, a semiconductor, about uh, two and a half inches by two and a half inches, and that's what we use for actually looking at the, looking at the gamma rays. But it turns out that uh, at energies that are lower than what we use for looking at the gamma rays, there is still some response of the instrument to what is also going, around, going uh, on nearby to the spacecraft. And if I could have the next graphic, please. Around the spacecraft in the magnetosphere, we know that there are charged particles, the plasma. Um, one of the things that, of course, has been a big mystery is that at the time of the Mariner 10 flyby, the first one back in 1974, not only was the magnetic field in the magnetosphere discovered, but there were also these bursts of energetic electrons. And um, this is something that we haven't seen on any of the flybys that we've had with Messenger going by, going by the planet. And we've have a, we have a detector that's on board, the energetic particle spectrometer, specifically for looking for events like that. And it's been quite silent during all the flybys we, we had. Uh, but then something interesting happened once that we finally got into orbit. And this just illustrates one of the things that, that can happen in particular with the gamma ray spectrometer that's got a very large active area that allows you to see things that 
you can't necessarily see with the other instruments. We've, of course, got, uh, there's a possibility of having electrons near the, near the spacecraft. Those are indicated on the left. And those can come in and actually hit the outer case of the instrument. And if I could go to the next graphic. They're not energetic enough necessarily to go through that case, but what does happen and what can happen is I can actually make x-rays internal to the instrument itself. And it's exactly the same physical process that's used in medical x-ray imaging equipment. It's exactly the same process that happens in the upper atmosphere of the corona of the sun, where that hard x-ray fluxes uh, are emanated from, uh, such as has happened here in the last couple of weeks. And so one of the possibilities we actually have with this instrument is not only in looking at the gamma rays coming back from the surface, but actually being able to see gamma rays that are being, that are being produced within the instrument housing itself if there are enough electrons in the region of space that we're flying through. Certainly the kind of usage of this instrument that it was not designed for, but again, it gets back to serendipity, having a, having a happy discovery based upon something one wasn't expecting. If I could go to the next graphic, please. And let me just, uh, let me just explain this for a minute. This is very similar to what Sean was just showing you with the, uh, where the, the, the magnetic... Uh, equator lines up on the planet. In this case, again, we're looking down on Mercury from the top, from the North Pole. But in this case, what we're looking at, the, the greens and the arrow regions, are the pieces of the orbits that are the, basically we've painted with the areas where we've seen these energetic electrons. And it's not a question of just simply flying through the area and having the electron flux come up. We see this as burst. Uh, sometimes they're only, uh, they're only tens of seconds long. Sometimes they last for several minutes. They're sporadic. But they happen like clockwork almost on every orbit. A lot of variations. And the other thing it's important to notice, note from this graphic as I look down on this, this isn't a coordinate system where that the sun is off to the, is off on the, the, uh, the right-hand side. And where we're seeing these, are located all around the planet. And if we could go ahead and roll this as a, as a film clip, this shows why that we didn't see them during the flybys. They're all in the northern hemisphere. Uh, sort of the darkish gray areas uh, or the lightish gray areas on here are, are pieces of the orbits that, uh, that Messenger was in, as has been in since we've gotten into orbit around the planet. And you can see the distribution of these things tends to be at mid-northern latitudes. Uh, the blue ones, which tend to be more symmetric about the planet, are at higher energies from the, uh, from the, the, the gamma ray detector. The lower energy ones are from similar physical processes that we're seeing in the X-ray detector. Again, this is the same two instruments that, that Larry was talking about in, in a region of the measurement chain where that there's no interference with what we're looking for with the geochemistry and nonetheless that we're able to get an idea of what's going on around the planet. And it turns out, of course, that with the three messenger flybys, those were all near the equatorial plane where we don't see any of these events. The Mariner 10 flyby back in 1974 was at high northern latitudes. And again, these events for all the world look exactly like what was seen on Mariner 10. So the reason we didn't see them on messenger is simply because we were going through the wrong part of the planet's magnetosphere. And if I could go to the last graphic, this is an attempt to sort of put all of this in context. Again, the sun is sitting off on the, the right-hand side, and this is a schematic that's showing a selection of some of the magnetic field lines. Uh, the solar wind blows outward from the sun and tends to compress the magnetosphere on, on the sunward side of the planet, and there's a, a so-called magnetotail where the, the field lines are drawn out on the other side. You can see the magnetic equator here in this schematic. We've displaced it northward. Uh, again, this gets back to what Sean was illustrating about the difference in this magnetic field from that of the Earth. And, and the, uh, again, the green areas are where we've seen the X-ray, where the X-ray detector has lit up with lower energy emissions uh, from electrons that have characteristic energies of maybe 5 to 10 kiloelectron volts. And the blue regions are where the, the, the gamma ray spectrometer has lit up with uh, electrons due to electrons that are, at, that are at higher energies. 
one of the original ideas was that if indeed there were energetic particles that they would tend to be concentrated in the night side of the planet's magnetosphere, but that's not what we're seeing. We really are seeing them all around the planet. And this is really different, again, from the sorts of things that we've typically seen in the Earth. In the Earth's magnetosphere, there was a lot of, of work uh, back after the, the Mariner 10 flyby speculation on how that uh, Mercury and the Earth's magnetosphere might be similar. But once again, as with some of these other observations, such as with the geochemistry of the planet, we're finding out that Mercury really is a world in and of its own. And we're finding that um, just like the Earth, it's got its own personality. Uh, Mercury is one of the terrestrial planets and therefore provides some context for what was going on in the inner part of the solar system back when the, the planets were condensing from the solar nebula. But as we look and as we continue to look with MESSENGER at Mercury, looking close up with targeted observations, using all of the, the various instrumentations such as things that were simply not available with the technology at the time of, of Mariner 10, we're managing to really explore a new world for the first time. We are out there on the edge. We're doing things with technology that had to be developed for this mission. And we're learning things uh, by being in a place that no human being has ever, by proxy, gone before. And that's what science and exploration and the sorts of things that uh, come out of the Science Mission Directorate at NASA are all about. And I think all of us are very pleased to be part of, uh, of MESSENGER as uh, one of these discovery missions which uh, has now gone through only one quarter of its nominal mission at Mercury and there's a lot more to come and all I can say is uh, keep following us, the best is yet to be. And Wayne? Thank you, you all and congratulations again. Uh, just a reminder to our television audience, all of the images that were presented today and much, much more is on www.nasa.gov slash messenger. Now, I kind of snuck in, in my introductory remarks, a little surprise of our own here. You heard about the surprises of Mercury, but headquarters has a surprise. So before we open it up for questions, I would like uh, Dr. Jim Green, the director of NASA's Planetary Science Division, to come to the stage. Thank you, Dwayne. And Sean, will you uh, please come here? Thank you, Jim. On behalf of NASA and the U.S. Postal Service, it's my great pleasure to give you a commemorative first day cover. It's everything Mercury that NASA's been doing. <laughs> For 50 years. For 50 years. <laughs> and, and as you know, with the stamps that have been issued, it's uh, forever. They're forever yes, stamps yes. and it's forever Mercury. And as Ralph said, more great science has yet to be coming uh, with, uh, with the rest of the mission. So congratulations to you and the team. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. The first that you have and getting Messenger into orbit. All right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see if we have any questions here. We're going to start here at NASA headquarters. Wait for the mic. Give your name and affiliation. Uh, Randy Shostak, reporter with EOS, newspaper of the American Geophysical Union. Uh, this is very exciting information. Thank you for the press conference. Um, I wondered if um, you could elaborate, uh, particularly on some of the latter comments by Dr. McNutt, and if you can put this in broader context in, uh, for me. Um, what does all this add up to? What do all these new uh, images, what do all these new findings add up to? And at this point, what are you most pleased about to date, and what, what are the the um, surprises and, and things that puzzle you the most? Well, I think that certainly the thing that we're most pleased about is that we're in orbit. We've got a healthy spacecraft. We've gotten through the hottest part of the orbit and everything is still working. Uh, you know, I, I've personally been involved in a variety of, of NASA missions and all I can say is that I keep being amazed every morning that I get up how well that MESSENGER is going. It has been, it has been a tremendous uh, partnership between the messenger team and NASA actually again pulling something off that no one has ever done before. I think in terms of, of what we're learning again one of the things that we said when we started the mission in the beginning is that uh, 
Mercury is that end member planet of the terrestrial planets. It tells us something about the inner part of the solar nebula. Uh, it tells us something about how the terrestrial planets formed ultimately. Again, the sorts of results that, uh, that Larry was discussing about how that the potassium to thorium ratio differs amongst the planets and that, and that Mercury has really been a surprise there. Uh, it's certainly clear from that, as well as from the images that, uh, that Brett was showing, uh, that uh, comments to the contrary, Mercury ain't the moon. Uh, there have been a lot of, a lot of comments that, that, that one would read saying how that, well, it just looks like another dead piece of rock like the moon. Why are, why are, why are we doing this? And the reason we're doing it is because uh, you learn something by going to places that we haven't been before. I mean, the solar system is our home. Uh, we're here. Uh, we know that. We don't know, uh, we don't know as much as we, we might like to about our origins and about kind of where, uh, how all of this came together. And by going back and, and taking a look in detail at places like Mercury, we're able to put more of those jigsaw puzzle pieces together. Again, Sean is talking about the fact that we've got this, uh, this very interesting magnetic field configuration. Uh, the only other place in the solar system where that you have something like this is uh, the magnetic field of Saturn, where that the spin axis and the dipole axis are aligned, and it turns out that the magnetic equator of Saturn is displaced northward of its geographic equator, not by as large a percentage, something like about, I think, six, I think it's like 0.06 Saturn radii as compared to about 0.2 uh, Mercury radii for, for Mercury. And, and certainly the, the, the environment and the, the chemistry and the, and the geophysics of Mercury and, and uh, Saturn are quite different. And yet, now we have examples of two active planetary dynamos in the solar system that shouldn't be there. And uh, for a long time, I know, with, uh, with the investigators at uh, first at Voyager, well, first really at, at uh, Pioneer 11, and then with Voyager, and now, of course, with Cassini, uh, there's been a lot of speculation about whether that Saturn was just sort of the odd man out. Well, now, we, with these messenger observations, we've been able to show that, no, it's just, it's just an example. It, it's one of two. I think, that, I think that one of the other really surprising things and very interesting things is, again, this, this example of how much uh, flooded area of, of, uh, of pyroclastic flows, these explosive flows of volcanism early in the history of the planet that there are. And, of course, one of the things we've remarked upon before are the, uh, the so-called lobate scarps, where that we see this evidence of, of mercury having uh, shrunk with the, the, the crust folding over. Uh, where, of course, Sean's been talking about the, uh, the, the idea about the, the, the ice and the, the craters and the fact that we have this LIDAR, uh, this laser altimeter that's now in orbit around Mercury, where that we can make these deductions about the overall topography of the planet. I mean, this is just incredible. There's, again, there is a, there's a lot more to come. So I, I don't think it's so much a question of what is the most amazing, but really the question of what about the mission and the results to date have not been amazing because this really is the undiscovered country and we really are for the first time exploring a new world. Do you have a question? You pass the mic and there. And name and affiliation, please. Hi, uh, Ann Walters with the German Press Agency. Um, you mentioned quite a number of observations that you've had that weren't what you were expecting to see. And I was hoping that you could maybe say what was the biggest misconception um, that there was about Mercury before you started this mission? The biggest misconception? Um, the biggest misconception was that we would go to a planet, orbit it for the first time, and not be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> and, and some, even in the planetary community, uh, after the Mariner 10 mission, um, placed a low priority on returning a spacecraft to Mercury on the grounds um, that it was very much like the moon. We had been to the moon. It was an example, to use a phrase coined by a very famous space scientist, one of the burnt-out cinders of the solar system. Um, and it is anything but that. Uh, just to elaborate very briefly on the eloquent summary that Ralph gave, 
uh, and give a little more context, uh, NASA is doing some other wonderful missions that are expanding at a huge rate our knowledge of planets around other stars. You know, Kepler has announced, you know, tripled the number of extrasolar planets recently uh, in their announcements. And, and many of those planets are at uh, distances similar to that of Mercury from our sun. Many are of, a growing number, are of, of, of masses that are approaching that of, of Earth and Venus. Um, but we have in our solar system four experiments in how Earth-like planets evolve once they form under slightly different conditions. Different distance from the host star, uh, different mass, uh, different starting composition. Uh, what we're learning is that each of those experiments had an extraordinarily different outcome. And one of those experiments, we live on. So it really behooves us to understand in a very general way how Earth-like planets uh, form and evolve and operate uh, and what Mercury is telling us is we didn't understand uh, in complete generality how planets of the Earth-like class uh, operate in detail. So uh, we're learning new things every day. Okay, now we will switch over and go down to the uh, Kennedy Space Center where I believe we have a question. Kennedy? Uh, hello, Ken Kramer from Space Flight Magazine. Uh, for anybody, please. Um, you talked about the, uh, the water ice at the North Pole. I'm wondering about um, how much of the surface do you think would, would be uh, covered with this water ice? Is the fact that uh, it was depressed about nine kilometers, I think you mentioned, does that increase or decrease the chances of uh, finding water ice? And um, Is the LRO data uh, with a similar instrument. Are you comparing results there, and has that been helpful in interpreting your data at all? Thanks. Ken, let me take that question. This is Sean Solomon. Um, in parts, <laughs> the, uh, the area of, uh, of polar deposits has been well worked out by the Earth-based radar folks. Uh, that area is quite a bit larger than on the moon. Uh, we don't know the thickness of those deposits. We know that it's thick enough to... Uh, to have radar bright characteristics for radar of different wavelengths, which means it's at least several radar thicknesses uh, in extent and the vertical direction, uh, meaning m meters or more. Um, there is a, a beautiful laser altimeter on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter known as LOLA, uh, and that is producing data at a, at a huge rate. And uh, the topographic maps that the uh, Lunar Reconnaissance uh, Orbiter is, is, uh, send, is creating from the LOLA data is just exquisite in its detail and is indeed uh, helping to define, as are uh, images taken from the same spacecraft, areas of permanent shadow. Um, and as you know, NASA has flown other missions like the LCROSS mission that uh, impacted into uh, one of the South Polar craters uh, thought to have water and other volatiles and showed quite spectacularly in on the basis of spectral evidence from the ejecta that, uh, that there is water there. But if water is the major constituent of the polar deposits on Mercury, then we have the irony that the planet closest to the sun uh, is going to have more ice at its poles than even our own moon. Uh, and so stay tuned. Uh, as this mission evolves, we'll be relying more and more on the geochemical remote sensing instruments, which take time to build up their observations. But the neutron spectrometer, the gamma ray spectrometer, have the ability to tell us what those materials are. Is it water ice? Is it something else? Uh, and we expect to have that answer before our mission is done. Okay, now we can go to the phone line, and uh, we'll take um, first Lisa Grossman from Wired.com. Go ahead, Lisa. And that the uh, data from the spectrometer is, is ruling out some models of what Mercury's composition can be. What models are those, and what ones are left over? You want to repeat that? Lisa, could you uh, repeat the full question again? I'm sorry. Sure, sorry about that. Um, I was wondering what the models of Mercury's composition and, and formation have been ruled out already by the composition data you're getting from the spectrometers and what possible models are still left. So uh, this is Larry Nittler. I'll take that uh, question, Lisa. Um, 
There's a number of models of the formation of Mercury that were proposed after the Mariner 10 observations in the 1970s indicated it had an unusually large core. And one of these models was that the planet formed at uh, normally or similarly to the Earth and had a normal size core, meaning Earth size core relative to the radius of the planet. And then because the sun went through a phase of extreme uh, high intensity in its earliest stages, essentially Mercury was so close to this, to this hot sun that the outer layers could have evaporated off. And in this model, this would have predicted very, very low abundances of things like potassium and sulfur and sodium. So we can rule out this, this kind of model. Uh, there are other models that... Uh, propose that Mercury formed from a specific kind of meteorite called a CB chondrite that are very, very rich in metal. Now, uh, these models make very specific predictions for the composition of uh, lavas and rocks at the surface of the planet. And for the most part, these are not in detail not in agreement with our observations. So these models in detail can be ruled out, but possibly variations on them will eventually uh, be proven to be right. Um, another model is that it formed, Mercury formed larger and similarly to the Earth, and uh, after it had formed an Earth or Moon-like crust, uh, another planet hit it and smashed off the outer crust and part of the mantle, leaving a residual mantle that could have then produced a new crust. At this stage, we cannot rule out this model. The data, some of our compositional data are, are certainly consistent with this, this idea in broad outlines. Whether the high sulfur abundance is uh, consistent with this, we have not yet figured out. But this is a model that's still, still in the running. And uh, there are probably going to be many more models devised before we have an answer on this as we continue to get interesting data. But thank you. Our next question will be from Peter Spots. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Our next question will be Peter Spots from the Christian Science Monitor. With the Christian Science Monitor, and actually that... Pretty much was my. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go ahead. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, am I getting through? Yes, I guess so. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, uh, that that actually answered most of my question. But let me just throw one one other one uh, related to that. And uh, is is there any possibility uh, for a migration of Mercury from forming in a bit more distant location in the solar nebula and somehow migrating in? I can take that, Pete. This is Sean Solomon. Uh, the process, I, I think you know, or you wouldn't have asked this question, of building up the inner planets is, a, uh, is, is one with a lot of chance encounters. Uh, we would call it stochastic, that uh, the interaction of growing objects uh, that start out many and become few uh, is not fully predictable. Um, and depends on uh, particular encounters that, that can result in, in growth of a larger object or disruption of an object. Uh, and some of those simulations uh, that have been done of the growth of the inner planets do uh, include the possibility that Mercury started to form at a different place in, the, the, in solar distance than it ended up. Uh, my late colleague, George Wetherill, uh, did some of the pioneering calculations uh, of that sort. Um, that said, uh, there are also interesting studies of the migration of planets once formed, uh, and this, was, this work was really stimulated by the discovery of extrasolar planets near their host stars, and a lot of the attention has been uh, directed at the major planets whose migrations uh, may have had a big influence on the history of small objects in the solar system. Uh, but there's a very interesting study by a French dynamicist of the long-term evolution of planet Mercury. And uh, their simulations have shown that some of the orbital characteristics of Mercury, like the large eccentricity of the orbit, like the large inclination that Mercury's orbit makes with the orbits of most of the other planets, are not fixed in time, but evolve. And they made a very interesting prediction in a paper in Nature a couple of years ago that three and a half billion years from now, it's not something we have to worry about next week, that there's a, a possibility that the orbit of Mercury will substantially disrupt the, the orbit of one of the other inner planets. And so uh, 
Uh, it, it's something that uh, our great, 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 great grandchildren might devote some time to thinking about that, that Mercury and its orbital evolution may have major consequences for the orbit of our own planet. But that's uh, a prediction uh, that may or may not be borne out uh, uh, according to an article in Nature. But uh, I, I can send you that link if you're interested, Pete. Okay, next up is Kelly Beatty, Sky and Telescope Magazine. Kelly? But is, it, is it possible? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah Pete, we're, we're, we'll give you an opportunity to do follow-ups because we, we're approaching the top of the hour. So uh, let's go ahead and go to uh, Kelly Beatty at Sky and Telescope Magazine. Uh, thanks very much. I came in a little bit late, so, uh, Sean, if you covered uh, the possible interior structure of the planet, I missed it. But if you didn't, if I didn't, uh, can you say anything about the interior structure of the planet, and in particular, what an offset magnetic field says about the state of the core? Okay. Uh, Kelly, uh, you didn't miss much on that topic, and, and we didn't cover it at great length. Um, we know on the basis of measurements made with Earth-based radar that uh, the, core, the outer core of Mercury is molten, like the outer core of the Earth, uh, molten, metallic, Iron rich. Um, we also know the approximate radius of the core on the, just on the basis of the mean density of the planet that's been known for 50, 60 years, uh, and it's a, at least three quarters of the radius of, of Mercury. What the asymmetry, the, the equatorial, uh, the asymmetry about the equator of the magnetic field means uh, has still to be sorted out by the theorists, but uh, one possibility is that the uh, field generating region of the outer core or the in particular the boundary between the outer core and the mantle uh, may be strongly different in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere this idea has been put forward as an explanation for an early magnetic field on mars that ha is much stronger in the southern hemisphere of mars than in the northern hemisphere to explain the strong magnetic anomalies recorded in crustal rocks on mars uh, and their locations, which are dominantly in the southern hemisphere. So I have no doubt that uh, our new results on Mercury's uh, magnetic field geometry is going to stimulate a variety of new ideas for how uh, Mercury's magnetic field is generated, how that field might vary with time, how it varies with position. Uh, and I look forward uh, to those models and to our ability to, to test them. Okay, folks, uh, we are going to have to uh, wrap up here at the top of the hour. For the media who are still on the line, please uh, get in touch with my office or APO Public Affairs to uh, get some follow-up uh, questions and interviews set up for later in the day. I want to thank you all for showing up and, and joining us today. Congratulations to the Messenger team. Again, go to www.nasa.gov messenger. Science never sleeps. <laughs>